what is like up with unity what's going on so don't worry about every uh, all these things like i just tried to make the class really efficient so i pre-did a few things uh, i'll be telling you about like all of them in just a second so what's up with unity anshuman already told you that uh, like how do we add a game object let's uh, like right click in hierarchy and create an empty game object what's going on here imagine an empty game object as it can't transform into anything so the cool thing about unity is it's a component system like so you can create anything out of this game uh, game object so if you right click right here add component okay so right here you can see you have different components available like there's a lot available right you can use any of these right here and say i want to create a button out of this game object so i'm going to search for button and click on this i don't want this right now i just showed you an example so what we can do with this is okay like also when you create an empty game object or any game object it might take a random position or random transform so you can go right here in transform this uh, three dots and click on reset it's going to reset its position and like all the values in the component so what's going on here is anything can be anything in unity so when i create an empty game object okay so when we have an empty game object we can convert it into a, in, an input field or a button by simply adding these components that are there but what unity does is these components are like really basic you don't want people to like uh, keep adding these things to an empty game object and create a button or an image or anything like that so they have made presets these are basically presets so in ui you have text you have image you have button all these things are presets you can convert an empty game object to these but unity has already uh, already done this for you now let's start a bit with scripting i have already created a script because obviously uh, like starting a script sometimes takes time so why don't you go ahead right click in assets go to create click on c sharp script without clicking anywhere else let's rename our script again this is not necessary but it's a good practice to rename your script i'll also be telling you uh, about why we are not clicking anywhere else hey so this is akash while editing the video so i totally forgot to tell you guys why we were not clicking anywhere else so i'm going to plug it right in here you can see right here your script has a class name and it's the same as your script name now this happened because we changed the name of our script before the script was created now if you click somewhere else without renaming the script the script will be initialized with the default name let's find out what happens if you rename the script afterwards as you can see the script name and class name are now different now this can cause a lot of problems you won't be able to attach this script to any game object now it's going to give you an error so let's call it a uh, class script or not and then i enter and it's creating a script for me you'll see uh, unity scripts start with a default layout or default content if you will if i uh, as you can see in the inspector nothing is visible because unity is right now setting up the script for me so it will load up the script for me in a second but we obviously don't have time for that it's like working on stuff you can see it right here in the bottom right so in the meantime we'll go on with the script we already have ready so what's going on here is uh if you guys have seen the variable video that we put up like earlier then that is cool you probably understand like somewhat of what is going on here if you haven't i'll just brush uh, brush up on this and you can watch it later so what's going on here is we have declared an int integer and we want to initialize it somewhere so we are creating a simple game the idea is to have the system create a random number generate a random number and then let the user guess that number cool simple enough mechanism now what can you do with this simple enough mechanism because game development is like a little about mechanism a lot about your imagination so what if uh, like let's start with this how we created this and then let's make it more interesting so what private does is private is an identifier it tells your script that this integer 
or function, possibly even function, is supposed to be kept within the script. Okay, so nothing outside of this script can access this uh, variable. So I have used this in start, and you can see I have assigned it a random uh, random number. Don't worry about how we assign random number for right now. Just use this. Okay, we are using random dot range. In case it doesn't work out for you, like it's showing some kind of uh, error or something, write this down. Because uh, C sharp and Unity both have their own random functions. Sometimes it creates a conflict. So you need to tell Unity uh, or your script which random number are you choosing to uh, apply here. So random equals to Unity engine dot random tells uh, your script that you want to use Unity engine's version of random uh, random function. Use random dot range, minimum range, and maximum range. What are these? These are basically parameters to this function. Again, uh, we'll be telling you about parameters a bit later. But for now, we have created two integer variables. One is min range and one is max range. Now these are public. So what this does is when I go to my editor, I go to my game object. I have already attached the script to this game object, right? Now you can see the public variables, min range and max range are visible right in the editor. So if I wanted to edit these, I can do it right from the editor. I don't need to worry about uh, going back into the script and changing it. So how this helps is if you want to point tune something, but you want to do it after like watching the script play in the game, like you're fine tuning how much uh, you want to rotate an object but you don't want to do it directly through script. You want to just fine tune it a bit based on your observation in the Z, right? So you can use public variables. Obviously that is oversimplification of what public is, but remember you can use it in the uh, scene. Also public variables can be used by other scripts as well. So when your program works with multiple scripts, they can use public variables. So now we have defined min range and max range. So our script will generate two numbers. Sorry, our script will generate a number that is in between this range. And debug.log prints that in your console. Again, your console is a debugger tool. It's a developer tool. So anything printed on your console will not be visible to anyone playing the game, but it will be uh, visible to the developer. So you can log whatever you want uh, in the game for yourself. So if you want to check like how is something working or what's the like in between transition value for something, you can do that through debug.log. We have printed our sum number variable in debug.log. Now we create a function. I have named my function check now. I have set it to public so it can be uh, it can be accessed outside of the uh, script because remember if it's uh, private, nothing outside the script can uh, access it even your editor. So you need to keep it public to have outside access to it. Now we use if statement. If statement, if you uh, if you've used C, C, C++ or any other language, similar language, you probably know about if and else. It's the same, but what's going on here is this value is actually a Boolean value, right? We are comparing two, num uh, two objects. It can be uh, like two variables, to anything and we're checking if they're the same. So this can return either true or false. So this will ultimately be a Boolean value. I could just replace this and call it true. And then it would uh, always go into this line. So what we want here is if our user has guessed the number right, then we check user's input. Again, I'll be telling you about this in a second. So don't worry about this and the number. And if it's correct, then we tell the user it's a correct or uh, it's the correct answer. If not, then we tell him to try again. Okay. So it's going to take a bit. Let's move on to the editor. So again, like I showed you the UI fields, we'll be going into detail in the third class for all the UI elements, but right now I have imported an input field. Go ahead and import an input field and wait, I'll just deactivate these. So you have an input field. 
remember to work with UI, I usually prefer to come convert my scene to 2D. So go ahead, do that. It's just better. I don't need to worry about the rotation and stuff. And then I'm going to zoom into it. Then remember the rec tool. Now this is where you need to keep in mind. Don't use scale tool, use rec tool. What scale tool does is it stretches the pixels. If you can see the text, I'll zoom in further. It's stretched now. Don't use, uh, don't use scale tool. Use rec tool to increase the size of this. Again, uh, good. Reset this. This puts it in the center. Use the rec tool. Use its size. Now select the placeholder. Placeholder is the text that will be uh, visible by default. So this can tell, uh, tell users what you need to uh, type in that input field. So I have like changed the font size to 90 right now. And in the text, the text part would be what the user writes. So whenever you enter something right here, okay, I'll see if I can play this without lagging. Um, okay. This is gonna lag a bit. Okay, so I'll just tell you. So text field, basically, whatever the user is going to input uh, in this input field would be visible in the text field. Okay, placeholder is literally just uh, the placeholder. It tells user what you need to write in there. You can write anything in there. So say you're uh, creating a login and authentication scene and you wanna have uh, input fields and you wanna tell user that that particular field is for uh, say, email or password, you need to enter email or password in that field. So in, uh, instead of enter text, you can change this. So you can change this to enter email. Cool. Okay. So you need to change this to enter email and then I'll just save my scene quickly and click on play. Again, this is going to take a couple of seconds. Uh, but once it runs, you'll see what's going on here. So when I click on this and I type something in there, okay, we didn't change the text size. We need to change the text size from 14 to something bigger. Okay. So I have uh, like written my name right here. Okay. So whenever I enter something in the, in, uh, in the input field, it's going to take out the placeholder and show me whatever I have entered there. Now let's make it a bit quick. So now we know what input field field is doing. So we can get into scripting part. So I'll remove this one and reactivate these. So now that you have your input field in your script, you can define an input field. Remember to define an input field, you need this using unity engine.ui. This is basically a uh, unity engines UI library. So whatever uh, library components you have, will be included in this. So uh, go ahead, import this and then write public input field user input. Again, we're using public because we want it to be visible in the editor. Okay. So whatever is public will be visible in the editor. We have user input as public and it's visible in the editor. I'll go ahead and remove this. Okay. So we have nothing right here. Once you have declared that you can come into the editor and drag and drop this. Guys, like if you have any doubt, you can unmute yourself. Like, does anyone have any doubt up till now? Can you re-explain this last uh, thing? Uh, which part? Like the one you just explained. Okay, input field. So remember, I uh, just told you, you, you can right click in the hierarchy, go to UI and import an input field. What input field does is it takes input from the user. So whoever is like using your app or game can enter text or whatever in there. This rectangle will be imported by input field. Then you can change the size of the input field using rec tool. Remember to use rec tool instead of scale tool. Scale ruins your UI. Use rec for UI always. So you can like change the size of this input field and in the input field, you can click this arrow right here and then change the font size for these placeholder and text. Once you have done that, your input field is ready. In your script, 
import using unity engine.ui. This covers all the UI elements. This is the basic library for all, all UI elements. If I take this out, uh, uh, it's going, yeah, sorry. So we already used using Unity Engine, right? So doesn't that just import all the libraries? Hey, so this is Akash again while editing the video. So I felt I didn't address this particular question that well in the class, so I'm going to attempt to do it again. So this question is about namespaces. This using Unity Engine.ui or using Unity Engine. These are namespaces. These are a broader topic of discussion that we'll probably be talking about in a later video or in a later class. But for the meantime, using uh, using Unity Engine and using Unity Engine.ui do not translate to the UI.UI part being derived from using Unity Engine. So, so this means we cannot directly use UI dot input field when we have used Unity Engine, but we can directly call the object from its root directory. So we can do something like Unity Engine dot UI dot input field. Now the problem with this is every time I write a new UI element, I need to again call it from its root directly. That becomes tedious, and we don't want that. So we are just going to use Unity Engine dot UI. Okay, so. Now we have uh, the input field set up. We have uh, declared a public input field. So we can drag and drop stuff in the editor for this. And then in the in our function, we have defined if user input dot text. So what's going on here is our input field user input has like different objects and different components, right? So like I told you, Unity Engine is uh, made out of components. You can access all these. So in your input field, you have this component right here. This is your input field and you have text. Remember, this is what we're working with right now. You have text. So whatever you write in there, like, should I play it again? Wait, that's just going to waste our time. So whatever you write in there is going to be visible right here. So your script can access that text using unit user input dot text. It's simple. User input dot text. So whatever the uh, field you want to access inside user input, you can access it right here. So you, uh, if you want to say, the, uh, if you want to make your user input non-interactive, you want people to not be able to interact with it. It, uh, sh it should remain read only or something. You can do user input dot interactive. That is a field. User input dot interactable is going to give me an error now. So user input dot interactable. So similarly, you can uh, access different components of user input using uh, this method. Now in our uh, if statement, we have user input dot text. So we are taking out the text from user input field. What do we want? We want to check if it's the same number as our computer has generated. So we have uh, checked it with some number. Remember, we have stored our random number in the sum number variable. And then what's this? Okay, so remember Unity is a game engine. You're always going to work with uh, different in-game components and not the console. So while you can directly print a number in the console, how your text in Unity works is, uh, I'll just declare a text. So I'll say private text text. Okay. Again, this is unity engine.ui. So if I go ahead and text, I have this uh, underscore text variable and I access its text component. You can see right here, it asks for a string. It's not going to take a, a, an integer or float or any other data type. It's going to ask for a string. So similarly, we have a text field right here. So we know it's going to take a string and pause, like it's string data type, and it can't be compared with a number directly. So we're going to convert our number to string. It's that easy. You write to string, number dot to string. You can do this with any, uh, most of the valid uh, data types, you can directly convert them to string. Now, if the uh, user string matches with the input text, it's going to give us a, a debug log of correct answer. Okay, so we are probably like over time, but I'm quickly gonna uh, like talk about how you can make an interesting game out of this. So remember, we have 
a very basic simple game right here but obviously this is not going to be enjoyable this is not going to be fun so how do we convert this we can convert this into something like a uh, russian roulette so whenever you and your friends are entering different numbers and you can play russian roulette with this you can go if uh, the number matches the random number this script goes boom or if it's not you save along with this you can uh, obviously add different stuff like in my scene i can add a text that says these things so your user knows when they're correct or when they're messing things up so in my canvas remember whenever you're using anything with ui you have a canvas in your canvas go to ui go to text and you have text so double click on this to focus on it you see it's like really small right here again use the red tool increase the box size increase the font size it's going to be more visible now let's drag it up let's do this okay uh, also if you click right here and press alt you can increase the size symmetrically otherwise it's just going to increase from one side press alt to increase it symmetrically now we have text right here what are we going to do next we have to define text for uh, in our script so we have already made a private text let's just convert it to public it's public now so we can access it through our editor let's go to our editor let it load and in our game object you'll see we have a new uh, text field let's drag and drop our text field now you can do one more thing you can just select it from right here, but it's gonna be a bit confusing because all of them are named the same. So uh, I can change its name, click on text, go right here to the top and say uh, game text. Now in my game object, I can go right here and it's already game text, but, but I can also choose game text from right here. You can click on this little dot on the right side and like view different things that are in your scene or in your asset. Okay. And you can even search for it. So if I wanted game text, I can just search for it right here. Okay. So we have our game text. Now, what are we going to do next? We have debug log, but now we want to access the text component of that text, right? It might be a bit confusing, but it is what it is right now. Text component of the text. So we are going to access underscore text dot text. And then we are going to say that we want to change this text to something particular. Like in this case, we want to say it goes boom. Okay. Otherwise, if you see, we want this text to say save. That's simple. We've used double quotes. Remember to use double quotes when you're uh, you're like entering a string. So use double quotes for string. This basically tells your compiler that this phrase right here is a string, and it should be treated uh, treated as such. So we have converted or uh, changed our text to boom and save. Now remember, when I play this uh, game. What's going to happen? I'm going to quickly save this. Remember, like, keep saving your game whenever you're making progress because Unity can crash at times. So I'm going to play this and it's going to take me a couple of seconds for the scene to load up. In the meantime, if any of you have any doubt, you can unmute your mic and ask right now. Okay, what does anyone? Um, in the text, what is the void? Um, I don't know. Something void is it, right? Sorry. Um, in the C sharp file, some void is is it in? Like it's some syntax. Okay, void, void. void okay, stuff. void stuff. Okay, so when when you're uh, creating a function, you need to define three things. First is if the function is public or private, that is who accesses the function. So that I have already told you guys. Void is the return type. So 
if uh, I was creating a function that took two numbers, A and B, then added that number, and at the end of it returned me a number, then I would need to tell the script or tell the function or tell the compiler that this particular function is supposed to give me some value back. These keywords, void or say int, if I had int right here, these would tell the uh, compiler that the return has a specific type. So what if I uh, what if I used okay I'll just give you guys a quick example of this okay uh, let's just see the play here and then I'll give you guys the example for function would that work yeah sure okay so what's going on here is in our console we have already printed the right answer but let's for the sake of it give it a wrong answer we have five and then we click on submit. It's gonna say here, see. We click on two and boom. Okay, so like one more thing, we need to uh, add the function to our button. So I'll just remove this in your button. Go to button on click and click on this plus button, uh, plus sign. You'll get this now. Drag and drop whatever game object has your function. So we have it in this game object and then no function. Find the name of your script right here and then search for the function name. Remember, there are a lot of functions. Don't be confused by them. Just look for your own function name. We have check now. Now this is going to take, like this is basically going to execute our function from right here. Okay. We are done with that. Uh, how, uh, how have we defined the function? We do public or private and then the return type this right here is going to be return type what this does is if i say int and then say uh, say add then i can say int a comma int b i'm defining two integer variables and then i can return a plus b okay so what's this going to do is it's going to add two numbers and then return it right back to me. So if I go right here and call debug.log add one and two. Cool. Now this function is supposed to return this value to me. And this function being an integer. See, you have defined the data type for the function now. Can be compared to another integer. You see right there, you have another. You're comparing it to another integer. But what if I do this? It's going to give me an error because my function is an integer, but this right here is now a string. So this basically defines the data type of your function, the return type of your function to be more particular. And void, uh, void defines that your function is not returning anything. So right here, we haven't returned anything from the function. We're just doing some work and that's it for the function. Okay. So that's why we're using void. Remember, if you don't define anything, like right here, we haven't defined private or public. It's going to uh, consider it as private by default. It's going to give me like some sort of, uh, I'm not sure if you guys can see this, this uh, green underline. And Radha is trying to tell, uh, tell me that I haven't mentioned the private modifier right here. But it's going to consider it as private. Okay. So while you can like totally skip over the private and public part, it's going to consider it, uh, consider it as private. You need to define void and like the return type of the function. Uh, do you guys have any doubt? Uh, where will the inf uh, method return the value? Like, will it show in the console or will it just return? Where, where will the return value go? You okay. can, uh, wherever you define it. So, like, what's going on here is it's going to return a value. It doesn't know where to return it. So, you need to specify where you need to return it. So, if I say some number is now equals to add one or two, right? So what this function does is this function is completely replaced by the value a plus b. 
and then that value is stored in some variable or something. So imagine you directly replace this function right here with whatever it is returning. That's how you can visualize it. Uh, this so function, yeah, go ahead. So do we have to debug log, debug log, log some number like in the interim method, or will it just return in the console automatically? Uh, if you want to see it in console, you'll have to write debug dot log. If you want to store it in a variable, you'll have to do it like what I did, some number equals to that function. If you want to do something else with it, again, you need to store it that way or you need to print it that way. So right now, if I do this in debug log, it's going to show me in the console. Let's see if it's showing in the console. Let the console like compile things and let's print this. So I'm going to play this and see right here. Okay, this is one more uh, thing that you can do with the console. When you need to know like what's going on right here, right? You don't know what output is this. And if you have like 15 or hundreds of debug.log, how are you going to know which debug.log is this? So this is going to give you the uh, output. Click on this and then you can see the uh, position of like position in the script where this debug log was called. So that is 18th line in gamelogic.cs, okay? 18th line in the game logic.cs called this. Add is going to give us the value right here. 